Hey, I know I try to focus on sci-fi content here, but hear me out. Let me tell you the story of a video game with its roots in science fiction that came out in 1985 with innovations and ambitions that most games of that era lacked. Let's talk about alternate reality. Immediately from booting up the game, people realized that this game was different. Games of this era usually dumped you on some title screen. Game intros just weren't a thing back then. And yet, this is how alternate reality of the city starts. A menacing theme starts as the alien spaceship proceeds with its abductions. Timed musical interactions? Just what is this madness? Here we start with a premise that may have started to have some popularity in TVs and movies, but was almost never explored in video games. This was a game that, alongside The Bard's Tale, released in the same year, kickstarted a new graphical age for CRPGs, a few years even before Final Fantasy, Might and Magic, Dungeon Master, or Wasteland came onto the scene. King's Quest, though released on IBM PCs and PC Juniors in 1984, didn't get a DOS release until 1986. Even then, many PCs of the era were still running on four-color CGA graphics, so Atari and Commodore systems were still the kings of computer gaming. Philip Price, who formed Paradise Programming alongside Gary Gilbertson, was the vision and programmer behind the first game. Datasoft published it. And yes, that is a separate musician credit, a rarity in an industry that barely even recognized its programmers. But this was one that was well-deserved, not just for its 8-bit notes and songs, but for its lyrics. Songs with lyrics in a 1985 video game, displayed like a karaoke machine. But as odd as it looked, this was a good use of mental subvocalization, connecting the notes to the lyrics, when computer technology wasn't yet ready for actual vocals. It gave additional context to the story as a form of world building. But more in the musical aspects later. Philip Price graduated from high school when he was 16, he wrote smaller hobby games on different school hardware as he went. He joined the military as a nuclear reactor operator and eventually moved to Hawaii. Price got a hold of his first Atari 400 computer and a cassette drive, reverse engineered the hardware, and started working with the same computer dealer that gave him the hardware. Gary Gilbertson was a graduate of Juilliard Music School, a keyboardist and a rock musician. He met Phil at the same computer store. In his words, Yet another visit to the store, and I came upon the owner playing with the Atari computer music cartridge. I thought it would be fun to fool with, so I bought it. The next day, I returned with some songs written on it. Phil took an interest in my ability to squeeze what I did out of the cartridge. He said, I could write a music handler that would be better than that cartridge. He also needed a place to stay, so I invited him to move into my house. During the first day at my house, Phil wrote the first version of the Advanced Music Processor. I was amazed he had written it in one day. They became fast friends. Gary wrote the theme to Star Wars the next day with Amp. Phil was already in the final stages of making his first Atari game, The Tale of Beta Lare, but his attempts at creating a song for it were not good. Gary stepped in and wrote in the intro song for it. The game was finally ready and they formed Paradise Programming as an equal partnership. 
The intro to Beta Lyrae was so grandiose in comparison to games back then that it made an impression with the people at Atari. Another one of Gary's songs was featured in Atari's main display at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in 1983, showcasing the audio capabilities the Atari computer was capable of. Two years later, they produced Alternate Reality of the City. After the musical number ends, we are thrust back to the cold truth that we're still in an alien spaceship. A counter blends game reality with real reality, as it's used to count down how much it needs to load from disk. The sound design took advantage of every bit of the Atari 8-bit hardware. From here, we finally get to a main menu, allowing us to create our own character. All of this intro can be skipped, of course, but it's certainly worth the initial viewing. We're presented with a gate that rolls a bunch of familiar RPG stat numbers, and finally we walk in. The player is thrust into a strange fantasy world. Inhabited by fellow kidnappees, struggling to survive this harsh reality. It's Izikai way before Japan drove that genre into the ground. And what is this display? A first person view? In 1985? Yeah, sure, some older games are experimenting with first-person views with vector graphics, or flight simulators with two colors representing the sky and ground, but this was actual ray casting, with real images that get larger as you get closer to them. This was six or seven years ahead of games like Catacomb 3D and Wolfenstein 3D. You know, those games based on the 3D engine developed by level 5 hyperdimensional time lord, literal rocket scientist, and the US's only defense against nuclear annihilation John Carmack. You know, I hadn't thought about it until now, but perhaps Philip Price actually is on the same power level as John Carmack. The comparisons are staggering. I wonder if they ever met. No, 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 no. If they met and shook hands, it would cause a singularity collapse of the space-time continuum. Sort of like that ending to Southland Tales. Did anybody see that movie? Am I the only person that sort of kind of enjoyed that movie, even if it was flawed and all over the place? Anyway, where was I? Raycasting. Cool, groundbreaking tech back then. PCs were still messing around with low-grade CGA and EGA graphics, and this Atari game was already going 3D with a first-person view. It had wastig controls, too, or rather IJKL on the right side of the keyboard. It took a while for 3D games to standardize on wastig, but Price already had close to the right idea with one of the earliest attempts. Let's get back to the music again. It wasn't just a one-time song with the intro this time. The music is throughout the game. There's a short little tune during encounters that identifies the alignment of each creature. Good guys get one tune. And evil gets a more sinister tune. It broke the silence and the sound effects of the streets of the city to force you to pay attention. Or you walk into a smithy and a song with lyrics plays in the background as you browse his wares. There was a funeral dirge that played if you died. The guilds played a song about taking in the stray wanderers.
and there were bands in the bars that played their own songs. A downbeat tune about living in this fantasy land. A lively adventure song about a man who bit the dragon's hand. A heartfelt duet about two lovers who are ripped away from each other when the aliens came and dumped one of them into this fantasy. In the game, you have your usual RPG elements, like strength, hit points, encounters from different creatures, but you also had hidden stats like hunger, thirst, moral alignment, intoxication level, disease incubation level. Even the main stats had both displayed levels and real levels, which could show a character who is deluded into thinking they are stronger than they actually are, or the opposite. Certain actions like charming or tricking creatures were considered evil acts. As long as you stayed good, the good aligned citizens wouldn't attack you on sight. Because anti-piracy copy protection was the hot new thing back then, alternate reality had its own creative take on it. If the weak bit checks on the disc didn't pass, the game would give you a fatal case of scurvy as soon as you entered the gate that would kill you shortly afterwards. Decades later, other games did weird in-game tricks to punish casual pirates that weren't smart enough to crack the game properly. While this wasn't the first game with copyright protection, this had to be one of the first examples of this kind of creative in-world retribution. Some people might consider this a negative, but the game also had permadeath, though not quite in the fashion most people might think of it. The game made the act of saving your character difficult. See, you had a save button that you could hit any time outside of combat. This would prompt you to put in your character disc, and it would save the game. But then the game would end there, waiting for you to reset. You would fire up a backup program to copy your character to a backup disc. The game manual even recommends you do this. The game would enforce this model by immediately writing to your character disc when you loaded it up. It would effectively mark your character as dead on the disc, and then you would play the game as normal. If you died in the game, you couldn't just reset the game and reload because AR would pretend that the character didn't exist anymore. Dying meant that you had to restore your character from backup before you can play again. This gave death a lot more weight made save scumming virtually impossible, and forced you to evaluate the time cost of saving your game versus the risk of dying and losing important progress. Although one thing you didn't lose progress on was map generation. And no, I don't mean the game kept track of your position and made a map for you. No, this was a time when you would pull out your own graph paper and make the map yourself. People nowadays might think this is tedious and quaint, but there was no internet to look up codes or facts back then. Nowadays, people get excited over complex ARGs that bury details in single frames of video or the spectrum analysis of a song. But before the internet, simple details like where you are in the game world had to be figured out. It wasn't uncommon to get some pen and paper to write down hints or passwords. RPGs of this era gave you an undetailed map or a basic starting point, but they all wanted you to draw the more detailed maps for yourself. It was an important aspect of exploring the city, finding secret entrances, solving a complex maze to find a new hidden guild, or counting the hidden doors to discover a tavern that has the cheapest food and water in town. The cartography was part of the fun. Okay, so what really makes this game innovative? Why would I call it too ahead of its time? Well, as hinted at by the title of the game, Alternate Reality of the City was more than just one game. Throughout the city, you would encounter doors to other areas. To the left was the arena. The wilderness was entered past the castle walls including at a hidden spot in a broken part of the wall. The palace to the right, and finally a few entrances to the dungeon on the northeast and southeast sides. These weren't to be just sequels, but extensions of the game itself. When you pass through the door to one of these areas, it would prompt you to insert the disc to the new area. You were meant to travel to the city, and when you bought the next game, you could then just enter your character to the palace and explore it like any other map. It was the beginnings of an ever-expanding MMO world, way before anybody can conceive massive, multiplayer, or online worlds. One expansion actually got made, the dungeon. I'll cover that one in a bit. Now, unlike my Babylon 5 video, I'm not going to walk through this retrospective of modern standards in mind. 
The game was innovative for its time, but the game can be tedious to play nowadays if you're not prepared for some of its shortcomings. For one, the city is hard. Real hard. Like sometimes a lowly giant rat could kill you hard. You start off with some light clothing, your bare hands for weapons, no armor, and barely enough money to buy a dagger. You're constantly eating all of your food packets and water packets at a rate of a few a day, and if you disengage the wrong way from an encounter, even the good guys and slimes would steal from you. Keeping up with basic needs is expensive. Inns cost money, taverns cost money, healers cost triple money. The smithy sells weapons and armor that you could only dream of wearing, daring you to actually save up the money to buy them. And all of this was ten times worse if you attempted to play a good character. Being good in this game is barely rewarded. If you decided to leave the daytime citizens alone and only kill the evil creatures at night, and if you managed to dodge the big bads that made nighttime hunting dangerous, there are creatures that can give you experience. Gremlins and imps are good and easy prey for low-level players, but they don't drop money. They can drop valuable potions, but you can't sell potions for food. After a few levels, you can target rats, but they don't drop money either. You can down muggers at this point, but what money they have is small. They are trying to mug you after all, and the rich don't do thievery. You know who does have money? Why yes, it is the rich folk. The noblemen. They might take a few levels to be able to take one down, but these guys are piñatas ready to shower you with gold pieces. You know who else has money to spare? Commoners, novices, apprentices, acolytes, hobbits, dwarves, merchants, especially the merchants, couriers, all the humanoids, all the good guys. It's almost like Price was trying to illustrate how evil does pay, and being good is next to impossible, especially in a world where you're kidnapped and thrust into a place with barely nothing except a few copper pieces and the clothes on your back. But I doubt this was intentional. Obviously starving, getting tired, or dying of thirst wasn't an option. The game didn't just kill you, but it would quickly drain your stats until you didn't have the strength to exist. There are a lot of punishing mechanics like that in the game. Diseases would usually drain your stats in some way. If you quaffed the wrong potion and got intoxicated, or just decided to hit a tavern and down a bunch of alcohol, the game would really let you know in the form of blackouts, walking and turning around, and constantly flipping through the screens at the bottom of the display. While this was amusing and creative, it made it nearly impossible to travel all the way to a healer to try to fix it. There were other design flaws and bugs here and there. The compass is not obvious when you first get it, and you had to keep flipping through the bottom screens to show it. This resets after encounters or walking into places, so it was really annoying to try to navigate. You really needed a compass and a map to get around in the city. It was very easy to get turned around and lost. Even hitting the option button when flipping through the menus wasn't quite intuitive. You had to hold it down and hope it stopped right at the last screen where the compass was. Walking out of certain places like a bank or a closed tavern required the joystick, because there just wasn't a button to leave. If you managed to play your character for an entire year and entered your bank, the banks would go crazy and try to calculate interest for 200 plus months, which would usually mean the account failed and lost all your money. And that's if you wanted to spend the hour in real time waiting for the calculations. There were a few known death traps in the southeast of the map, where you would enter a one-way door without any way to leave. There were hidden guilds in the game, which gave you a stat boost the first time you found them, but none of them allowed you to join. There were also many places that you found that said that they were closed by the Order of the Palace. Some might ask why these bugs were allowed to exist, but I think most would predict the answer. The game was unfinished. The city was an innovative game, but it was also a flawed and unfinished game. It gave people hope for a series that offered all of these carrots in the form of places that couldn't be visited, features that weren't yet implemented, but plans for fixing them in future games. And while this game did well in sales, it wouldn't be as beloved a series if the dungeon wasn't released. The dungeon was truly the game people remembered. Ironically, while Price consulted for the dungeon, he had much less involvement with it than the city. What actually happened? Why didn't Price continue development on AR? Greed happened. Datasoft, the publishers for AR, entered into a contract with Paradise Programming, where Gary and Philip owned the game, but Datasoft had publishing rights for 10 years. Paradise Programming would see 7.5% of net profits from the series. Datasoft also had conversion rights to convert the game to different computer systems, which they abused. What started on the Atari 8-bit was converted to Commodore 64 and Apple II. Okay, so more accessibility to different computer systems is good, right? 
To give Datasoft time to support the conversions for the Christmas season, Price had to cut development short on the city. This left the game with the aforementioned bugs and missing features. Even the dungeon wasn't planned to be a second game. It was supposed to be the sewer system of the city, but Price just didn't have the time to add it in. So the game was somewhat unfinished, but with conversions it made millions of dollars. A success story, right? No, not really. Datasoft subtracted the cost of the conversions from their profits. Philip and Gary didn't see a dime of their 7.5 net profits. Datasoft paid them advances to make sure they didn't starve, but it was a paltry 15k in comparison to the millions Datasoft was making. This was maybe double the minimum wage at the time. So, with the sour relationship between Price and Datasoft, the publishers enlisted Ken Jordan and Dan Pinall, along with a few other programmers, to finish development on the dungeon. Price still consulted on the game from time to time, but only to help Ken and Dan finish what he started. Gary still wrote music for the game, most likely songs that were already finished by the time Paradise Programming and Datasoft had their falling out. But once it was finished, the dungeon did go out with a bang. The dungeon improved on most aspects of the original game. It had better graphics and a cleaner interface with a compass on the left side. It had a spinning timer to indicate when the game time was paused or spinning quickly. The game had four levels, with each one half the size of the last. Just the first level was the size of the entire city map. The game was so big that it took up three discs and the first level had to be split up into four quadrants. Most of the original guilds had their dungeon version right below the city's location and you could join them finally. Spellcasting was now a big part of combat. The beginning area had a supply shop, a bar, and a place to sleep. You no longer had to hunt down the right tavern that sold food packets and water. In fact, they were the only shop, tavern, and inn, but there were plenty of other unique places to explore. So many weird and interesting areas, puzzles, places to visit for both quests and for better gear. There were unique items, and many of them were better than anything you could buy. You had more of a purpose to explore. There were stories to follow, all in the hope of figuring out the mysteries of who captured you and why. Alignment was a much bigger part of the game. The guilds were clearly good and evil, and you couldn't just join a good guild as an evil character. You could raise your alignment by donating to poppers or visiting a chapel. The chapel would tell you what your alignment was. In fact, people who ported over their city characters to the dungeon did find out quickly that killing all of those commoners and noblemen sort of kind of turned them evil. The chapel allowed you to reset your alignment, but you would need to give up all of your worldly possessions. Did I mention you could play the same character in the dungeon, just like what Price wanted in the original concept? Well, maybe not exactly like it. Instead of just entering the dungeon disc 1 when you entered the door, you had to save your character in front of the door, make the usual backup, boot up the dungeon, and then import your character. Ken and Dan didn't quite understand the patching system Price implemented in the city, but given all the improvements on the dungeon, I'm not positive if the game would have been flexible enough to accommodate it. But hey, it might have been something that hyper-evolved Alpha Giga Intelligence trapped in a humanoid form Philip Price could have pulled off. Best of all, this game was much easier than the city. The beginning area had less hostile encounters, and you weren't constantly fighting a severe shortage of money, food, or water. Combat was more nuanced. You had a chance to encounter a group of creatures, but you also had AoE spells, wands, horns, and trump cards. It still wasn't a cakewalk, but at least you had a much better chance of surviving. It also had its own creative solutions to problems and innovations as well. For example, adventurers would often amass a bunch of different weapons, armors, one-use items, spells, and other junk in their inventory. Most had their own properties to them, which all took up precious memory. To combat this, there was weight in the game, and too many heavy items would slow you down. If that wasn't enough and you were still hoarding a bunch of lightweight items, 
The game would punish you by sending the Devourer as a surprise encounter to start sucking up your items at random. Some encounters may have been more difficult, but none were more feared than a craven monster that can suck up your unique treasures. Like I mentioned earlier, the dungeon really ramped up the story to go with its world building. The main quest, which really was just tied to any of the smaller quests, involved rescuing Ozob, an apprentice to this wizard named Acrimiel? Acriminemeral? Anyway, he's actually just a dead spirit who's still somehow bound in this reality, and he wants you to piece his staff together. So, through a series of quests, you find all three pieces to his staff and return it to his tomb. You discover that our wizard friend is actually a different kind of alien from a different reality, who had a penchant for popping into these different realities and getting himself into trouble. He wandered into Zebek's demise, but he eventually got caught by the same aliens who kidnapped you, and was trapped for further study in this kind of ghostly limbo. When you do get him the full staff, he'll reward you with a pack or a portal access card, a device which has a strangely modern sounding name, compared to all the medieval fantasy items you find. On the first level of the dungeon, you'll find its sewer system, the beginning area, and many, many different mazes, puzzles, unique items, and traps. On the second level, it's exactly a quarter of the size of the first, with another set of places, a few guilds, this dwarven smithy who can craft excellent weapons and armors for a high price, a potions master behind an incredibly complex maze, a dangerous crystal cavern maze, a mirror maze with a clothes horse at its center, and more. On the third level, it's again a quarter the size of the second, but it has a dragon, a curious riddle-speaking gargoyle, and other treasures. But there isn't an obvious entrance to the fourth level. However, there is this one-way gauntlet of dangerous encounters where your magic is disabled. At the end of the gauntlet is Death's Door, a foreboding-looking door that has a suspicious-looking slot on the front of it. If you use your pack card, it takes you to the fourth floor, with metallic walls, robots, and yes, what appears to be some of your alien captors. If you're wielding your ever-useful mirrored shield, when you walk into the control room and face an alien operating the controls, you'll bounce the laser back at him and survive the encounter. So after two games of fantasy-laden antics, we finally get a taste of the sci-fi that hooked us from the beginning. Just beyond the alien control room is a new chapter or entrance that we hadn't seen before. A gateway to revelation. New plans, new hooks into future games. There were even one or two super secret puzzles that required going back to the dungeon after getting knowledge from later games. But sadly, the dungeon was the last game made. In the meantime, other conversions for the next generation of 16-bit computers did happen. Atari ST and Amiga owners both enjoyed their version of the city, complete with improvements and bug fixes over the original. The graphics were much nicer, and the Amiga version also had the ability to work jobs, join guilds, and cast spells. Though, I can't say I like this goofy MIDI conversion. Let's, uh, switch that to something else. Much better. Anyway, all these conversions cost a lot of time and effort. While robbing Price's livelihood in the pursuit of more conversions was morally reprehensible, the fact that Datasoft burned through all of his profits to do so illustrates how much money it cost. Ken and Dan even worked on 16-bit versions of the dungeon, but at this point, Datasoft was sold to Software Toolworks. They got as far as a 70% complete version of the dungeon, and even some plans on what the arena would look like, before Software Toolworks had laid them off. Greed was certainly a factor in alternate reality's demise, but with computer technology so fragmented and expanding at an alarming rate, the idea of a multi-part series was just not feasible on a technical level. To put it in perspective, just compare Super Mario Bros. on the NES with Super Mario World on the SNES. That's a jump from an 8-bit era to a 16-bit era with 7 years in between. Now compare that to a game like, say, Far Cry 6 in 2021 and Far Cry 4 in 2014. Still seven years apart, but the technology jump was nowhere near as drastic. I could still download and play any of the Far Cry games on a modern computer, even the first one from nearly 20 years ago. But this wasn't possible in 1985. The IBM-based PC barely had the technology to produce games with anywhere near the kind of video and audio quality that computers like the Atari and the Commodore could reach. 
There wasn't really a dominated computer system that had lasting backwards compatibility. In short, alternate reality as a game series was too innovative to live. So there were plans for seven games, but we only got the two. Fortunately, Philip Price wrote an outline of what the series was planned to be. Of course, there was the original kidnapping from Aliens, where you were taken to the city, and the dungeon where you could dig deeper into the grander puzzle. The arena would have given us pit fighting. Price even had plans to patch in slaver bands in the city who would waylay you and throw you into the arena. You could fight to regain your freedom and gain nobility. The palace would be a Game of Thrones-style maze of power and political intrigue. If you could successfully climb the ladder, Chaos is a ladder. You could defeat even the current king and become one yourself. The wilderness was just outside the city, and you could make the journey to find out the real truth beyond this reality. Revelation is where you encounter alien metallic corridors with advanced technology. This is where you see the real parts of the spaceship that kidnapped you. And finally, Destiny, the final chapter, where you discover exactly what alternate reality really is, which I'll get into, but not quite yet. Fast forward to 1998. Philip Price is in talks with Monolith Productions to start work on Alternate Reality Online. A new fresh take on the Alternate Reality Universe, now as an MMORPG. It was a promising start. Gary started making AR music again. Initial artwork and interfaces were built. And as somebody who played the dungeon a few times already, I remember being really excited to see this series again. But it wasn't meant to be. The MMO market was still fresh, the risks were too great, and Monolith couldn't get the funding. Alternate Reality Online just couldn't get off the ground. So what actually was the secret to Alternate Reality? What would your character discover on that spaceship? Destiny would have revealed a large chamber of metal cocoons. Cocoons of humans and possibly other life forms imprisoned, forcing to live on a different reality. Whoa. Quoting Price, the minds of those entrapped are tapped and fed with images. The ship's computer can even permit the images to interact with solid material components of the ship. You're an image. What is reality? Your body lies in a cocoon. Your mind sees what the image sees. What is a soul? What is experience? You experience. You feel what this image you have been controlling since you've been kidnapped feels. In the end, you're left with many choices. Continue to live with your image body, a nearly immortal life, but knowing that these aliens have done this to you and can watch, feel, experience whatever you do whenever they want? You're their entertainment. They have become jaded with luxury, power, and knowledge, and use lesser beings to regain some of their passions of life. You can cut off this channel, though they may also destroy the ship, or Earth. You can escape in a smaller ship and go back to Earth. You could blackmail the aliens. You could sell out humanity. You can try to bluff them. There are many choices, life isn't easy, and some of the most important decisions are the hardest to find a best answer in. This was an outline from Philip Price back in 1990, when he was out of the gaming industry and thought AR as a series wasn't going to see the light of day. In another interview, he recalls a story about meeting two guys in a restaurant near UCLA, where he describes his vision of AR in its story, comparing it to Dark City, which just came out in early 1998. After finishing his conversation, one of the guys remarks to him, ideas can't be copyrighted. Was it actually the Wachowskis? Did they copy this idea and use it in the Matrix? No, Price already refuted that it wasn't them. But the Matrix did come out a year later after that encounter. Who knows if this was some story that got shopped around Hollywood and became an influencing idea. Or maybe it ended up as that other movie that was released at the same time that dealt with virtual reality. What we do know is that in 2005, Monolith Productions the same game company that talked with Price about alternate reality online, they released, you guessed it, The Matrix Online. Did The Matrix movie end up killing alternate reality online? Probably. The ARO website first cropped up in December 1998, and only a few months later, The Matrix hit theaters. With similar plot connections, and given the sheer popularity of The Matrix, Monolith might have considered it yet another risk factor which doomed the fledgling concept. After all, why risk MMO levels of budget on a 15-year-old concept when a much newer and more popular vision could be your next big project? Even still, Alternate Reality's arrival was a lasting influence on the computer RPG market. It certainly had enough sales and versions to capture the public's enthusiasm for the genre, and still attracts projects to try to revive the series. 
The 3D ray casting in AR was the start of an early era of first-person games, ones that led to Wolfenstein 3D and Doom. And MMOs did happen, and they did express an expansive open world, with many different characters, abilities, stories that grew with each expansion. Series like Xenosaga and Mass Effect detail stories that follow a single character over multiple games. So, the technology and opportunity may have failed to realize Price's original dream of a game series, but the concepts and ideas remain.